And now if you will join me in reciting the serenity prayer. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. There may be some here who are not familiar with our tradition of personal anonymity at the public level. If so, we respectfully ask that no AA speaker, or indeed any AA member, be identified by full name in published or broadcast reports of our meeting. The assurance of anonymity is essential in our effort to help other problem drinkers who may wish to share our recovery program with us. And our tradition of anonymity reminds us that AA principles come before personality. This meeting concludes the formal part of our great 25th anniversary meeting. Bill's talk last night concluded with a message rededicating AAs everywhere to the basic principles of our fellowship and the delivery of copies of that message to the representatives of foreign countries who came up on the platform and were given copies to take back to their countries and symbolizing our own country copies of the message were delivered to the chairman of the host committee on the platform this was a message of rededication and in a very special sense this morning's meeting is devoted to a, our rededication to the spiritual principles upon which this fellowship is based. And who more fittingly could serve as chairman of such a meeting than our co-founder. And so I give you the chairman of this meeting, Bill. As we all know, God our Creator is from everlasting to everlasting, and He is timeless. But we who gather here are very sensitive to the passage of time in this brief transit of ours. and to events that mark great turning points in our lives and in the life of this movement. So we have been gathered here in these three wondrous days in gratitude and in self-survey and I might add the light touch by saying, as the conductor of that self-survey, I caused you to deep freeze the traditions for about two hours on cakes of ice. It was necessary, I thought, 
since a day like this may never come again to any of us, that we set certain things upon the record. And then we came to the rededication of our lives and fortunes, to the service of the Father of Lights in the pursuit of freedom for ourselves and for all those to come. So it is altogether fitting that we are gathered here this morning in the spirit of our twelve step, which suggests, yes, it enjoins us to try to perfect our conscious contact with God. Everybody knows that the principles by which we live, the grace on which we daily subsist, was and still is transmitted to us through the gentlemen of the cloth, through their predecessors, going back to Moses and the cross. So, it is a wonderful thing to feel that we can be led in this effort to reach a more conscious and loving contact with our Creator by such two dear friends as we have sitting here. One, a very old one, one who is utterly vital to our beginning, another, a more recent one, but following on in this tradition of loving help to and association with us. We've talked about the language of the heart, and this is often best transmitted in silence, and certainly after what transpired last night, I think silence is my best way of completing my transmission. <laughs> but before presenting each of our dear friends, I bid you not farewell, but au revoir, and may Providence so design it that I may still meet many of you as we trudge the pathway to whatever destiny God has in store for us of AA. So no farewells, but au revoir. And I think Lois would like to just do that too. Please sit down. Thank you very much. And thank you for all your love. Bill and I, our hearts are full. We can't say any more than thank you and au revoir also. John J. Dorothy, president of Seton College. He operates under this name and style. 
I am very glad to say that from his church and its men of the cloth, one in particular, that darling, that saint, Ed Dowling, he who said, if I ever get to heaven, it will be backing away from hell. <laughs> this was at St. Louis. We hope you'd be here, and I have a notion that he's probably swinging a leg off this table now and saying, ain't it swell? <laughs> yes, uh, I live closer to that man as a spiritual advisor than any other person in the world. It has been a great privilege. And now comes somebody who is very dear to an ever-growing circle down in there in Jersey. The extent of his love, his guidance, even now, I suppose all, only God knows for us of AA. He is beloved. He is charged. And so we'll now get down to his right name and say, Father John, lead us. Thank you, Bill. My dear friends, a few years ago I used to tell a story very often. I told it about myself. I guess it's part of my case history. I told that when I, I studied in Rome, and when I came home, that uh, the pastor, being very proud of his young parishioner, asked me if I would give a talk. I was very flattered with the invitation and excited, looking forward to the event. And so I prepared very diligently the talk, and when I was getting it ready, I thought I should pick something rather apt to begin with. And so I chose the lines, since I'd been away from home for some years, I chose the lines from the story of the prodigal son. I will rise and go home to my father. And so I chose that as my text and wrote out my talk and memorized it. And when the day came and all the neighbors came to see what this bright young man could do, I uh, mounted the pulpit with some trepidation. And I gripped it very firmly and said in the best voice I could summon, I will rise and go home to my father. <laughs> I couldn't think of the next line. <laughs> and so gripping the pulpit more firmly, I said more loudly, I will rise and go home to my father, but I wasn't going anywhere. And I decided that this was, this was terrible. And so I turned and walked down the steps of the pulpit. And the pastor was behind the pulpit there in his place. And as I passed, he motioned with his finger to me. And I went over and bowed over his shoulder. And he said, John, he said, when you get home, remember me to the old man. <laughs> No, I told that story so often I was afraid it might have got to California. <laughs> but apparently, well, maybe it did, maybe it didn't, I don't know. But uh, I'll come back to the prodigal son later on. But uh, 
Now I'm going to spend a few minutes with you, and uh, I'll tell you what I'd like to do. I think we may uh, say, as I said a moment ago, uh, use the expression, uh, my case history, but I was referring it specifically to the topic which is my understanding of God. And uh, I think that each of us has a case history in the understanding of God. And uh, I am confirmed in that judgment because I recall that St. Paul said, when I was a child, I thought as a child, I spoke as a child. When I became a man, I left aside the things of a child. And I think it is true of every one of us that as a child, we have a child's understanding of God. And then as we grow and have the experience of living in adulthood with its ecstasies and its miseries, its heights and depths, sunlight and shadow, all these that I describe figurative language, these things help us to come to the realization that the child's understanding of God is not enough for a man, that a man cannot live really a life as a man with a child's understanding of God, that he has to substitute for it a man's understanding of God. Now, in order to do this, it's something like the fellowship, I think he needs help. I wouldn't suggest at all that uh, to understand God better, someone take me and place me on a desert Ireland. Uh, Ireland. <laughs> My speech professor will be abashed at that. Um, <laughs> that someone placed me on solitarily on an island and let me figure the whole thing out for myself. Uh, no, it has been really through a fellowship of many that I, uh, I hope that I've come to something more than a child's understanding of God. And uh, that fellowship... It's not merely in the present, it's also in the past. It goes way back into the past. And uh, these uh, people are not recorded for us, as we're being recorded today for others, but uh, the great spiritual leaders of the past are recorded in writing. And I, I think now of the writings of the past that have helped me to come to a fuller understanding of God. And uh, I would like to uh, just refer to a few of those, I think, for example, of the lovely lines of the psalmist, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament announces the work of his hand. Or the other lines of the song, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the Son of Man, that thou should visit him. Thou hast crowned him with honor and glory. Thou hast made him a little less than the angel. It's lines like this, or the other lines of the psalm. As the heart panteth for the living waters, so does my soul long for thee, O Lord. When shall I come and appear before the face of my God? It's that sacred poetry that communicates to us the fact that men centuries ago, centuries and centuries ago, had this, this experience of God, this reaching out for God, this search, this seeking, this striving, this longing, this burning, this yearning. These, these things my forefathers felt in lands far distant. And these things they expressed and they have come down to me through a chain of many tongues into my own tongue. And one of the great privileges of my work has been to be able to go back through tongues and to read those poets, those inspired poets in their own tongue, the Hebrew language. And so we owe much to the fellowship of spiritual men through the centuries who have brought to us something of the realization of God. And the, the thing that emerges as we delve into these men of the past 
And as we delve further into human experience and our own experience of ourselves, is that really God is beyond understanding. That the creature gets a glimpse of the Creator here. Only a glimpse. As Paul put it, we see obscurely, as in a mirror. And he was thinking of the old bronze mirrors they used that became tarnished. And you saw yourself only dimly in that mirror. And so it is our vision of God. And so I say this to your encouragement. Do not be too anxious if your vision of God is not something like the brightness and the brilliance of this day. All you need is enough of the vision of God that your faith will supply. They say that God is light. And if you get enough of his light into you, enough light to walk by, apparently he feels that's enough for now. But if you go following, seeking in this light, there will be more for another time when you need more. For I think it's part of the mystery of God that he reveals himself so slowly. And sometimes that you must See him from the flat of your face through a dark night of despair. And somewhere far up above you there seems to be a candle. And that's your hope, that your help is up there. So do not be impatient with yourself, but keep on seeping, seeking, keep on searching. Keep on longing that you may come to a fuller understanding of God, that you may leave behind the things of a child and move ahead to the things of a man in terms of understanding God. And so I say the thing that emerges from this reflection and delving into men of the past is that God is mystery. And when you reflect for a moment on that, he would think, well, it, it should be so. It should be so. If God's world is so mysterious, certainly its makeup must, must be more mysterious. Take, for example, certainly there is much of you that reveals itself in your eyes. The expression in your eyes, the joy I've seen in so many eyes during these days. The radiance. The enthusiasm, the love, the eyes mirror this. And so they are a reflection of the spirit that's within you. But the eye, the wonder of it, the wonder of seeing, to look up and behold this space so masterfully colored by God. To look about us in this, in this country decked with flowers and to see and to breathe his love within the rose and all the flowers. This, these things are wonders that God has made. The human eye is a wonder in itself. The ear that hears, the heart that beats, the brain that thinks. We know something about these things, but the mechanism of the brain is, is still a mystery to be explored by medicine. And if this be mysterious, should not the maker be mysterious? Great, beyond human created comprehension? Should he not be mystery? And if it's too simplified, may, may you not suspect that this is really not an image of God, but some little man-made image in words or in colors on a canvas? No doubt all of us thought of God as children as an old man with a gray beard. Later on, we come to realize that gray beards are a sign of age, and age is the closest thing that we can, humans, can get to eternity, and therefore we use that as a symbol of eternity. But that God is not old, God is eternal. It has nothing to do with age. And so we come to disabuse ourselves of these childish notions and move into the sense of mystery of God. And all about us, this world proclaims that he is 
majestic and mysterious and beyond our comprehension. And yet, we know more than that about him. When we go back to some of these great spiritual leaders of the past, we realize another thing about God, as they understood him, I think, and it's very impressive to me every time I read it again and again, is the vision of Isaiah in chapter 6, when he, be, he said, I beheld God, beheld the Lord. His majesty filled the temple, and the angels covered their faces with their wings, and they repeated without ceasing, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, all heaven and earth is full of thy glory. And he said, I am a man of unclean lips, and I speak to a people with unclean lips. Woe is me. And one of the angels flew to the altar of incense and took from the altar a burning coal and touched his lips in the vision and cleansed his lips with the burning coal. And then the voice of the Lord was heard to say, Whom shall I send? And Isaiah rose to his full stature and said, Here I am, send me. Once he realized that something of the holiness of God had been transferred to him, something of the cleanness of God by the burning coal, he was ready to accept the mission of God. But the lines I want to emphasize are those words, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, for this is a revelation of God, the holiness of God. Now we know the word holiness. We use it so much. But do we know the meaning of the word on the lips of Isaiah the Hebrew? Kadosh, kadosh, kadosh. For Isaiah, that word meant that God was beyond, beyond the profane, beyond the shabbiness, the soiled earth. And the word we use is transcendent, the transcendence of God. And for that time and that place, this manifestation of God as transcendent was a majestic revelation to the great prophetic figure of Jerusalem. And so we owe so much to so many through the centuries in the revelation of God. God, as they understood him and helped us to understand him. And so part of the fellowship, and I think particularly our part in it, is to share with you whatever God has given us through his many, many spiritual figures through the centuries in our understanding, because we can give our time and our study to the effort to understand God better. And so the revelation of God came to his great inspired poets, his great inspired prophets. It came through his poets, through the times, and of course the saintly poets, such as the one I love so dearly, St. Francis of Assisi. I've been there many times and loved to walk down its streets. There's so much like the streets when he walked down them. To look up over the Umbrian Valley and to stand on a little balcony where he composed his hymn to the sun, beginning in that lovely, beautiful early Italian language. His praise to God when he asked the sun, our mother, the rain, to bless and praise God. The water, so abundant, so pure, so jocund, so strong, praise the Lord. And then he ends that so beautifully and serve him all serve him with great humility and I feel that you have a great understanding of that last line serve him with great humility for humility brought you into AA humility has kept you in AA 
You grow in humility through the fellowship of AA. You leave the things of a child. And one of the great things of childishness is pride. And you leave it and cling to humility. So please, serve him in great humility and you will come to understand him better. And so on, we come through and through so many great spiritual figures, great minds, great hearts that have revealed God to us so that we've come to see him better. And I would like to finish with the greatest. The man from Nazareth. And I would like to choose a few aspects of his revelation which I think are most meaningful to you in your effort to understand God better. I've often quoted AA meetings, one of the lines of Jesus, which I think are very meaningful to you. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And yet not one of them falls to the ground without my father's knowledge. How much more worth are you than many sparrows? The very hairs of your head are numbered. This is a consoling revelation. The very hairs of your head are numbered. This is a consoling revelation. I recall one time in an AA talk, I chose three symbols to bring out three ideas, and the first symbol I chose was the hair of your head. A hair of your head. And the hair of the head, I chose as a symbol to bring me into this encouraging line of Jesus. But I've just repeated for you, are you of not much more worth than many, many, many sparrows? The very hairs of your head are numbered. This is a consoling revelation. I recall one time in an AA talk, I chose three symbols to bring out three ideas, and the first symbol I chose was the hair of your head. A hair of your head. And the hair of the head I chose as a symbol to bring me into this encouraging line of Jesus. But I've just repeated for you, are you of not much more worth than many, many, many sparrows? very hairs of your head are not. Isn't this consoling to hear from the lips of Christ? Isn't it consoling for you to hear it? Who may have at one moment in the past thought of yourselves as utterly worthless. Not only the hairs of your head, but your whole being was without worth, and you had been dropped from the human family. There are other revelations, other words that are most consoling, I think. And one of them certainly is the word that you say at the close of each meeting. Our Father, who art in heaven. Other words that are encouraging are words of the disciples of Jesus. And one I think you'll understand is this. I have said that God is mystery, God is holiness, God is majesty, God is transcendence. But I think it's more encouraging for you to hear what John wrote, God is love, and he that abides in love abides in God and God in him. And as we meet here together, your friends in the clergy, what do we say to one another? We say, where have you seen such love? 
so you know the understanding of love, and in a very eminent degree, let me assure you, and understanding love as you understand it, I think you can understand God better through it. For God is love. Turn to the word, our Father. And that you might understand better the meaning of that word father as Jesus used it. He said there was a man who had two sons. And one asked his father for his inheritance and went off and wasted it until he was penniless. And he was ashamed to go home. Finally, when he found himself in the pigsty, he said, I'll go home. And he started home. And the line I want you to notice especially is this. That the father saw him a long way off. And he came to meet him. And I'd like to point out that if the father saw him a long way off on that day, he saw, he did not see him for many days before, for every day he looked. And so for every day of your drinking experience, God has looked. And finally, one day, he saw you a long way off, and he came. And he put a ring, as that father in the parable put a ring on his finger, and fine garments on his back, and food on his table, and made a feast for his return. And when his brother complained that his father had not shown him such attention, the father said, You I have always, but he who was lost is found, and he who was dead has come to life. And you can understand that story of the prodigal son, can't you? And if God has given you good things, perhaps, I mean the good things of faith and hope and love and humility and sobriety, and the things you've come to know in this fellowship, if he have, has given you these things, perhaps by meditating upon the gifts he has given you, you will come to a greater understanding of him who has given them. For he is the giver of all good gifts. And it could not be otherwise. Because God is love. This recording of Sam Shoemaker speaking at the 25th anniversary of Alcoholics Anonymous was made from a previously duplicated recording supplied to us by a longtime member of the fellowship. The background sounds you hear of aircraft and person speaking were not on the original recording made at the anniversary's conference. It's so chance. That's Sam, our next speaker, our friend of old time, was the first to stand in this relation to me. I shall never forget my first sight of him there in his pulpit. But it was more than a sight. And it's down. It was a feeling that here was utter honesty, great courage, 
complete forthrightness, and here we demand, who more than any in those early days made me feel that the vision which had been so given, suddenly given to me was real. So Sam, to me, and to Abby, and thence out all into our society, has been a channel of grace like no other. I think he is called the Reverend Dr. Samuel Schumacher. But well, I'm going to call him up here as Dan. Dear Bill and dear Lois and dear everybody in AA, because there isn't any crowd in the world that I love more or feel more at home with than I do this crowd. In St. Louis, on after this same occasion, a gal said to me, you may not be an alcoholic, but you sure do talk like one. <laughs> well, I've been looking forward to this tremendous 25th anniversary, as you have. It has been one of the privileges of my life to be associated with all this from the early days. I still think that Bill gives me more credit than I deserve, but he does that with a lot of you, and that's why he makes swans out of so many geese. <laughs> we were doing some work in my old parish in New York, Calvary Church, that was helping some people to find God, and Eddie and Bill and some of the early founders saw some things going on that they thought might be helpful to alcoholics, and they incorporated them in principles. We also had made some mistakes that didn't need to be make, made twice, and they didn't incorporate them in. <laughs> and these 35 years have seen millions of people's lives different because of what began to happen in those early and sometimes unpromising days. Together with you all, I thank God for what's happened. Now, in a way, principles are more important than persons, hence anonymity. But principles alone never save anybody from defeat and trouble. You probably preached many a sermon to yourself when you were in the greatest need, like I have. Principles have got to be found at work in people, so that they become incarnate and visible and available to people in need. They've got to be clothed with life and with caring and with intelligent action and emotion. Behind people that have found an answer, there are other people that have found an answer. And so on back through a long kind of apostolic succession of real, genuine spiritual discovery that must have been set in motion originally by God. But he didn't give those principles a kind of a primeval push and then expect them to go by themselves. He was in the principles, he was also in the people who were living out the principles and in whatever spiritual methods they used to find helpful in carrying those principles out and winning their battle. I think in all human transformation, whether of a directly spiritual kind or whether through that which doctors and psychiatrists and other men of science do, God is present and at work. Whence otherwise, otherwhere, comes faith and hope to desperate people, or indeed any desire to be better instead of crawling away to die like an animal. Now, the program of recovery turns, as we all know, on the faith in a power greater than ourselves. Willpower and the appeal to it as sufficient 
to get any of us out of his troubles are a snare and a delusion. That is not only true about alcoholics, that's true about everybody else. When you think you're able to manage your own life without God, you add five to whatever other sin you may have. And five is not only the first of the seven deadly sins, but it ought to have a category all by itself. Because it's vastly more subtle and vastly more dangerous than any other sin, whatever. It's all inside the in the seat of God. Many people's problems begin to be solved the minute they know they can't solve them by themselves. That puts pride right out of the driver's seat. God would be psychologically necessary even if he weren't theologically necessary. Nobody but God is big enough to tell the human ego to move over. But now how's that going to be suggested in a program that was to reach not only Catholics and Protestants and Jews, but skeptics and agnostics and atheists and total non-believers in any kind of a God? Some people have had unhappy experiences with churches, and many think they have. <laughs> How? <laughs> How are you going to avoid the recalling of those experiences with possibly disastrous emotional consequences? A word or a phrase that brings back an unfortunate association isn't the right one to use, especially in these early stages. And it was, I think, one of the true inspirations of the Twelve Steps that phrases like a power greater than ourselves and God as we understood him were used. They meant that if anybody came into AA with already formed loyalties that concerned, let's say, any one body of Christians, that loyalty would not be interfered with. It would be strengthened by their AA association. They meant nobody was going to tamper with their religion. They meant you could begin with a very modest faith for really what one was dealing with was... The mystery. Whatever power is helping these other people you may not know much about what that power was. We only knew these people used to be defeated, and now they were victorious in one very important area of life. Now, that never did mean, nor can mean, as the Monsignor was telling us a moment ago, that we remain satisfied with the truncated idea of God with which probably we began. The God that is, is a great deal more than we can ever understand of him, and we learn more of him by experience than ever we do by argument or futile discussions with the beliefs as to whether our own church is better than some other church. Now, if we're satisfied with the beliefs that our church tells us to hold, then we'll go along with them and grow as that church encourages us to do. But if we come to AA with little or no faith, our initiation does not begin by being asked to swallow a lot of doctrine that we're not yet prepared to swallow. A.A. says begin with as much faith as you've got. There's something, there is some higher power that's helping these people. What we have to deal with is the God that really is, and not all human concepts of him. Much better for anybody to pray to the God that is. He with no name and we with no words, than to pray to your own creation of God with words prettier than a poem but fictitious. I think the first prayer gets through because it's trying to be in spirit and in truth. And we hear that the Father seeketh such to worship him. The second will not get through because it's said out of conformity to somebody else's faith and not out of the heart. Sometimes for beginners, suggestion is better than explication. Some of the often absurd modern names for God, like the man upstairs, are crude attempts to... Use an easily grasped picture to suggest God rather than to use theological language to dogmatize body. Beginners need all kinds of practical self-starters, encouragers to experiment. But nobody ever found Faye sitting in a chair reading a book and wishing he had it. <laughs> we often begin by acting as if faith were true in order to find out whether it is true. And that's precisely what the scientist does when he thinks the hypothesis may be true. He treats it, treats it as if it were true, longer to find out whether it's true or not. And the same way, is, it, it, it works out the same way with faith. I've always thought the first step taught it 
ought to be made severely experimental and put within the reach of the greatest skeptic, provided he's got an open and an honest mind. I can't get away from the feeling that fundamentally AA is a spiritual experience. What gives the lift is the power greater than ourselves. I remember the very early days of Calvary Mission in the gas house district on 23rd Street in New York. A charity came in one night named Larry. He came because he had met on the street an old pal of his in the days of what they called sin and drink, whose name was Fred, but he was called in the underwear of the spider. And he greeted the spider by saying, I thought you was dead. And Fred said, I am. <laughs> the fellow you used to know is dead. This is a new one. And Larry was puzzled and intrigued, and he asked how it happened. Fred said, see that sign across the street? He said, yes. If you come down at 8 o'clock tonight, you'll find out what changed the spiders. And that night, without any vestige of faith of any kind, never having heard of God or Christ as anything except the swear word, Larry made a stop. He'd been brought up by an atheist who'd been kind to him. And he wound up in the underworld with no knowledge of religion whatsoever. Now, to what did he begin that night to surrender his life? To the God he saw at work in Fred. To the God that had changed Fred and might change him. And let me tell you, Fred, pretty nearly 30 years after, is still going strong. Now, uh, AA has never had any of the usual connotations of a rescue mission. But this combination of exposure and experiment, of seeing the higher power at work in somebody else, and seeking the same experience in one's own life, goes on in the lives of all AAs who have no faith whatever to begin with. The experimental approach to faith, and I think it's a good one. There'll come a time when you can't leave it as just an experiment. You've got to grow, as the Montaigne has been telling you. You've got to go on and think out what has happened and use your mind about it. You'll probably be a good deal stronger if you link up, as he suggested, with some outfit that exists to help people definitely with their religious faith. For we need to grow in the spiritual dimension. And we certainly don't want to make a church out of AA. That would cause trouble. <laughs> but as a precursor to the church, what St. Paul called the law to the gospel, a tutor, a schoolmaster, to get us ready for the church, I think AA stands second to none. But it has been wisdom to keep the church and AA, ordinary religion and AA, separate, as it has been wisdom in America to keep the church and state separate. Doesn't mean they don't work together. It just means neither of them tries to use up the functions of the other. Thank God for the amount of cooperation that there is between the churches and AA. Now, this is one thing that I think the churches and all agencies that deal with need for a change in human nature would do well to heed this experimental approach. We need our scholars who can give us reasonable approaches to these great realities of spiritual faith and life. But I think it's very seldom that mere good reasons or arguments get people much above their trials and temptations and illnesses of body or soul. It's evidence that does this. It's the sight of somebody who's been healed and changed. Arguments very often confuse and irritate and drive wedges. But the evidence of experience makes clear and draws and unites. There's a verse in the Acts which says, Seeing the man that had been healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. Do it and people are glad you did it. Get into a discussion about how you did it or what did it and you'll be separated from it in about five minutes knock all the broom off it and somebody's going to get mad. In many places, the churches are giving people good arguments. What they ought to be doing, and at best they are doing, is giving people some samples instead. I think this is the thing that AA is doing around, all around the world. We don't hold up these people as saints and paragons anymore. The church holds up its people as saints and paragons. We don't say, look how good these people are. We say, look what they used to be. And how much progress is being made and come join this fellowship of honesty and of need. If this ever got to be a league of dry and righteous people, 
Well, I'm not going to finish that sentence because you'd all be drunk with sundown. <laughs> I've known a good many saints and spiritual leaders in my time, and I don't know a single one of them that didn't have clay feet. I don't mean they were insincere. I don't mean they were hypocrites in the ordinary sense. I just mean they were human beings like myself. And human beings sin and fail just as long as they continue to be human beings. That's not a cynical statement. That's only an honesty. That's to get people out of this sky blue atmosphere they think they get into when they come inside churches. It doesn't exist. All claims to perfection are for the birds. But sobriety and mended lives and new relationships are within the grasp of everybody, provided we seek and accept the help of God as we understand. And let me say something else. Problems always allow for some people in AA who continue to say that they don't believe in God in any conventional way. I hope there's some people I got here this morning. And recognize that they have found sobriety as well as those who do so believe. We must speak of how much AA has done to change what we meant when first we may have said God as we understood him. For all too many of us, God has been a concept only. As the Monsignor said, a figure with a long beard and a book in which is being kept a record, usually the unfavorable record. <laughs> and he's been a figure to frighten us or to call us to task while he sat there in a kind of celestial judgment on the sons of man. That picture of God goes out of the window when you discover him as a power and a force, someone to whom you go when you need the response of understanding and the offer of help that is called grace. We may say this represents the difference between a dogmatic and a dynamic God. Between a God who asks of us, or we think he asks of us, the impossible and a God who helps to bring his will within our nearer reach by helping us all the time to draw us closer to it. The whole world, non-Christian as well as Christian, owes an unspeakable debt to Jesus Christ for revealing to us a God who is like himself. Loving, patient, forgiving, eager to help, while yet expecting us to live according to his law. But A has provided an important footnote to this. None needs to know the reality of this kind of God more than those who have known the ghastly loneliness and terror and desperation of most alcoholics. Before anything else is suggested about a change and a cure, the first impression that people of God ought to give is the impression of what Mayfield calls the everlasting mercy. Now God's expectations of us, and they are high, are part of the everlasting mercy. But when we have disappointed those expectations, as who of us has not, and when we know ourselves to be beyond the reach of any merely human help, the first face of God we need to see is the face of love. Jesus didn't always show that face to the professional religious of his time, but he consistently showed it to the needy and the disreputable, the outsiders and the outcasts, the helpless and the desperate. And eventually, even the unlovely Pharisee recognized that he needed the challenge presented by Christ when he spoke, even in scorn and in judgment, for that was the only thing that would puncture his hard skin and get through to his heart. We've been seeing already that wonderful picture of the prodigal and the Pharisee in the famous story of the prodigal son. That bad boy went off and raised Cain in a far country. And the good boy stayed home and behaved himself but with what seething resentment towards his father. And when the wastrel came home and the old man had a party for him, that good boy was furious and he wouldn't even go in. And all he said to his dad was, you never even gave me a kid so that I might make merry with my friends. We had a great wit in the Episcopal Church, Bishop Johnson of Colorado, who was preaching about this one day. And he said, as for any friends that fella had, a veal cutlet would have done him. (laughs) 
But I've always had a kind of a hope that after the prodigal stayed away a while, stayed home a while, those two brothers might have gotten to know each other in a new way. I suggest it was a little frosty between them when he got back. But maybe the prodigal learned something about discipline from his brother. And maybe the brother learned something about forgiveness from the prodigal. Truth is, the good brother's heart was almost farther from his father's heart than the prodigal's was, way out in the far country. Good people often need to learn a lot about mercy. There's just one thing that out-and-out sinners can thank God for, and that is for a problem that is too serious to hide. It's a good thing to have learned even the hard way that all of us need continuous repentance and that we have no power of ourselves to help ourselves. Not only are the naughty God's problem, even more of God's problem, I think, are the good. Years ago in New York, an old woman in my parish asked me if I would talk with a young woman alcoholic who was a friend of her granddaughter about drinking. This older woman had belonged to the church since before I was born. I said to her, you're a Christian, why don't you talk with her? She said, well, you see, I've never had that problem. <laughs> and I said, neither have I. <laughs> well, I went on to say some things to her about getting tight on impatience and self-will and self-righteousness and some other things. So that it never has been much of a jump from me to the people that get drunk on gin and whiskey. You see, she had told God many a time on a Sunday morning that she was a miserable offender, but she didn't really feel like it. <laughs> Else it wouldn't have been hard for her to talk about any kind of sin with any kind of person on the face of the earth. That's what the Christian church is. It isn't all the best people in town on parade, it's the people in town that know they need help. Now, if that's the church, I belong, and you belong, and everybody belongs. You know the story about the two old Ruiz that went to the Episcopal Church one Sunday morning, got in just in time to hear the minister say, we've left undone the things we ought to have done, and done the things we ought not to have done, and nudged his friend. He says, we're in the right place. <laughs> now, there's just one answer for any sin and any need on the face of this earth. And that lies in the forgiveness of God for the past and the grace of God for the future. I take that to be the spiritual angle of AA because it is the spiritual angle for all mankind. I close with a prayer that is said to be the prayer of a long dead slave. O oh Lord, I ain't what I ought to be, and I ain't what I want to be, and I ain't what I'm going to be. But, oh Lord, I thank you that I ain't what I used to be. 